Hello there and welcome everybody, B-Man Livestream BLS 007 and this is another show and tell with Lars Brink. Lars, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hi, I'm very good. Thank you very much. How are you? I'm doing very well. I'm super excited to, to continue where we left off last week. Um, Me too. Super nice. Yeah, we had, uh, so you were, uh, people reaching out to you asking if, if we wanted to do more. Um, yeah. I had a similar question on YouTube, which is uh, super exciting. It's great to know that people like this stuff. I personally really like the episodes. I learned a ton of things. And um, to the extent that I actually started working on a um, set of schematics to generate the structure we talked about last week. So that's all pretty exciting. That's all direct outcome from doing these kind of things, which is um, super nice. And uh, let me quickly pop up. Oscar, thank you very much. I enjoy very much what you're doing, guys. Well, we really appreciate you being here and um, asking us for more. So without further ado, let's dive into it. I can um, share my screen right here. And what is probably good is to quickly run over the structure that we have in this app. Uh, maybe start off with the repo where people can find this stuff. So. Let me make sure that I'm sharing the right stuff. Hey, Nacho. Nacho, hello. A fanboy over here. Well, it's awesome that we have fans. Um, and um, yeah, super excited to be here. So for those of you watching, if you want to follow along with a structure like this, since last week, I've been working on NXPM stack. And what NSPM stack does, it is creating a structure for you with a backend and a front end and a few predefined um, modules. So it's basically an opinionated way to spin up your full stack. It's not perfect, but uh, it, it, it works. And um, these instructions here should help you get started, build a very similar stack. At some point, um, and, and if you're here, Make sure to check the projects. I got a, a few notes here, things I'd like to work on. Um, but one of the ideas is here is in this um, idea notes that I have. I would love to have a workflow where you can say yarn create an XBM stack and give it a name. Go in there, run yarn dev, and that should be all you have to do to spin this up. And there's a few more prerequisites, but um, I'm gonna chat about the stack itself uh, some other time and how to work with it. But um, yeah, let's let's quickly look at this. And if you have any questions or comment, Lars, at this uh, during, please feel free to to jump in. Um, but when we look at the structure here, we have an API which is a NestJS project that only has like one app module. The rest of the features is all um, imported in here. And if we look at the admin. We have a very similar structure. All well, the app component is basically just your router outlet, just how we like it. And then in here in the app module, um, I load in the admin feature shell module and I load in the feature core module. And this might be the first question already uh, or the first point of discussion after we looked at the structure, like where do we do core initialization? So I think this is a question that generally pops up for a lot of people. Um, and, and like, so um, when we go over the libraries inside libs, we have a structure where we do the same, um, use the application name as a general division. And then inside here, we have the data access, data access layer, uh, the features, and the same goes for API. Um, so I think that's a, a, a general structure. This is basically where we left it last week. And then what I did was split up the API in some more logical units. So we can take a look at those. Um, but I think the first uh, the first one might already be here. So there is what, a question. There is a question. Yeah. Which what branch, branch are you are, working on? Um, I mean, I actually don't think I pushed up this repo. Uh, so it's, let me quickly check the branch. I'm on main and uh, let me just commit changes. Uh, live stream and I'll create it. I'll create the GitHub repo and push it up right away so you can take a look with me. 
it'll be on my GitHub, github.com slash bman. Repo is called BLS007, BLS007. You can see the repo listed here in the, in the comment. Um, cool. So with that out of the way, um, as I suggested in our previous episode, I have a feature shell model module and this is basically what a lot of people probably would have in their app module what i used to have in my app module honestly which is the, the top level routing this is all cleanly split up now at this moment this library also more or less does the navigation so if we take a look at the application here we see that we have a few links a few different pages and this is this this navigation would generally live in probably a thing called header um, then this is um, maybe a shared UI state, maybe it's really, it belongs to the feature. So I think that's that's mm, an interesting topic, like how to do um, okay. application-wide navigation. But the first real question I got with regards to my... Uh, well, can I can just answer that quickly. Yeah, sure. I, I would put that navigation in a UI library mm -hmm. in the component exported there. Okay. And then and then if, in, like if the links are static, like they are right now, mm -hmm. they would just be in the, the presentational component. But if you needed to get some data from the server or an environments file, whatever, to uh, generate the, the links, yep. you would have that in a smart component. And th since this is a feature module, uh, you could, could have that data fetching and all that in this component and then just forward that uh, structure to the presentational component. So that would be the structured way of doing it in, in my opinion. Yep. Okay, so I think a uh, common use case is that you wanna sh show a different set of links for somebody that's logged in or logged out. Yep. So the classic example is a login sample. This. So this admin feature, admin feature shell component would be the place where you would, for instance, uh, get your authentication store from NGRX and then select your user and maybe based on that determine what links there are? Well, you would do that in route guards usually, right? Right. Okay, but I think the UI, so this, this is one thing that I left out and um, UI is a very common question that people have when they start working with NX. So. Uh, maybe we can start actually building our first UI uh, library to to do this. Um, so one of the things yeah. that is interesting, uh, you mentioned the um, enterprise monorepos with Angular or Angular enterprise monorepos, the book by Narwhal. Uh, I read it over the last week. I can highly recommend people reading it. It's a bit outdated. So um, if Narwhalians are reading it, we'd love to have a revised <laughs> copy, even if it's just saying this is this still holds true. Um, but I think version zero dot two, please. <laughs> yep, we want the next draft. That's all we ask for. So Jeff, if you're checking this out, please give us this. That would that's all I, we ask. I know that one of them is working on an an updated one for React. Yeah, I've seen that as well. And actually, it might be good to quickly show this. Um, so if you're a fan of Narwhal, if you're using their products. Which is but probably. I, I always, um, I can't remember if it's Jack Shu or Jason Jean who's working on it. Um, if I recall correctly, it's Jack, but I'm not totally sure. So if you go to connect.narwhal.io, you can get a free account there. And oh, yeah. here you can see the books, and it's indeed Jack uh, that does effective React development. And then the enterprise Angular monorepo patterns, these are the patterns that we uh, apply in this. Yeah. in this series um and so i think the, one of the main takeaways here is there's four type of libraries and you never need more so that's like okay if there's only four natives you have <laughs> data access feature ui and utils and and then i would say i you hear you laughing your lars what's, yeah, what's I would, yeah i would say you can add your own those are some of the archi archetypical ones that they recommend right but you could also have one just with types you could have one for your domain you could have right. one for configuration yeah okay so 
Um, in your opinion, you can just take these four basic ones and then add to it, but at the same, using the same logic. So you would have domain dash something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Um, so in the um, NXBM stack that I worked with, I basically hard coded. There's only four ways. So when you do mm. it, when you generate a library, you let's let's do it. Let's generate a library. Uh, so There's also a test a test utils library type. Right. Okay. So this is definitely interesting, and there so there might be more things uh, to this. So let me. Um, no, it's not now. NXBM slash stack. And what I did is create an admin lib um, schematic, and I'm going to dry run this. Okay. Now, what this thing needs to know is a name and a type. So it will be name and type UI. Oh, so Bane, if... that's an interesting name. That's great. <laughs> great name. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Bane so let's... Uh, for instance, um, uh, let's say the... Um, the, the, the generic UI library, for instance, let's let's say I want a UI theme, right? I want to generate a UI theme a library, yeah. and I need to tell it where it goes. So I'm just going to pass in the directory admin, and this should generate an admin UI theme module and an admin UI theme lib. So here we go, libs admin UI theme. Yeah, I usually call it layout, but of course, let's go with layout. Up to you. Let's let's make this how you do it. This is a lot of things I'm also like, yeah, I just picked something and I stick with it, which is probably a good idea in general. Um, so that creates the layout. And then I think a lot of people, the initial question that they have is where do I actually import the styles? So if we check this website, the result of this uh, project, the running version, oh, I need to pick in here. Uh, you see, I added some simple bootstrap or bootswatch team. And currently, this team lives in the admin source styles.scss. Oh. So here is just where I basically import my style. Yeah. Um, if we want to keep our app as tiny as possible, I would probably love to have this out, out of here as well. Definitely. Yeah, make it portable. So let me copy over this one. And that's probably the first candidate that goes here. Yeah, that's actually an another special library type, styles. Okay. So I, I create a shared styles library. Okay, cool. And that's not one of the UI feature util or data access. I mean, if you only have these four types, mm -hmm. UI would probably be the most appropriate one. Yeah. But it's really a special one because there will be absolutely no TypeScript in it. Um, I have the recipe for doing this uh, manually in my tiny uh, Angular applications with NX article. Right. And there's a, a few other special ones um, that we might discuss in this session, actually. Cool. Yeah. I think uh, it might make sense at some point to revise this for selections. So right now, I the, the point is I cannot use this generator. I could generate a, a regular lib, but let's keep a UI style for now. Yeah. Uh, but we'll generate this one then, right? Lip shared UI style. Yes. Um, well, um, okay. So let me see your lips folder again. Uh, yep. Let me what does the top down. of it look like? Get the, the whole, the, whole uh, the lips. Um, so this is, yeah. We have admin API in shared. Yeah. So I would put it in a shared folder inside of the admin one. I right. mean, if you're if you don't have it grouped into subdomains and, and, and features, I guess just put it in the admin folder. Yeah. The, so it, the, U, the UI styles library would be in there in admin instead of shared. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'm what I'm gonna do then is call this one admin and I'm just gonna leave the oh, I guess I can remove it as well. So people get an idea on how to remove libraries. So you can say NX generate. It feels kind of weird to generate something that removes it, but <laughs> oh, that's where we are. And that yeah. would be shared JS UI style. And this, this should go into my project and figure out what the shared UI style 
library is and be able to remove it. It looks like it can. So yeah, people- Excuse me uh, for a second. Uh, so people, you can uh, remove libraries from your Annex workspace by using the add normal workspace schematic or package and use the remove schematic on that. Um, so then if we take a look here, we can see that UI style now lives inside admin and not inside shared. Um, Sorry that perfect. the NG Viking shirt was, was a bit too hot. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, so cool. So now we have UI layout, which is probably going to be your header. There's going to be your navigation links, etc. And then the UI style for this moment will just contain the SCSS file. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So instead of the index.ts, I usually have an index.scss yep. in the same location. Yep. And then inside of the the uh, lib folder, I I would put the, I would have one, for example, called global.scss and import that from the index scss. And since it's uh, my, I'm the guest on the show and tell, we'll do it my way for now. Yep, totally. <laughs> no, I love that. Uh, and do you do global like this or with an underscore? Underscore, yeah, it's a partial. Yeah, yeah. I thought so. So then this would all live there. Yeah. And then from the index, we basically add import dot slash lib. Yes. Global. Right. And we could have uh, multiple entry points here next to the index SCSS. We could have one for loading uh, settings and tools. So that is functions and mixins and variables and all that good stuff. Right. And we could import them from the component, uh, from any component, basically. And to be able to do that, easily we would add it to there's something like a preprocessor preprocessor uh, include paths something like that in the angular builder right. configurations right this might be an interesting one to look at because this is something i never really got so um so yeah if we have some spare time and otherwise maybe in the next session like yeah, how to properly sure. do this so okay cool and then inside our index ts we don't need this Angular level module, right? We don't need the index TS at all. This is a, a writes a special library, and tests uh, don't really make sense either. So I would uh, even remove the test uh, target of this project in the NX JSON file. Cool. So let's go ahead and remove this, and then we can get rid of the jest config as well, um, yep. and here the spec JSON. So that's a nice cleanup already. Um, and then open the workspace.json. I think it's an Angular-based project. Yes, it is. And then if we search here for UI style, UI style, yes, we have the whole test piece can go here. Can get rid of this. Exactly. One. And uh, yeah, even the lint. Mm, yeah, doesn't really matter either. So we don't have any builders in this admin UI style. We, we, maybe we could have a SAS, SAS lint. <laughs> right, right, yeah. But that's uh, about but it. There, there should be no TypeScript in this one. Perfect. So that also means that this style.css, let's just leave it empty uh, and do basically how it's delivered, any app-specific styles here. If somebody wants to do an ad hoc thing, they can. The file is still there, but we prefer not to right. use it. Right. And then this, of course, will render my app without any layout, as we can see right now, as expected. So the way to do this is go to Angular JSON, and uh, inside here you just replace this with the library. Well, you you left the styles file there and said that you could put specific styles, so you should mm -hmm. still leave that one if you want to keep that functionality. But yeah, you yeah. would add a comma and then. Uh, reference the libs slash admin admin uh, UI, UI style source styles.scss. Uh, index.scss. Sorry, you're totally right. Index.scss. Let me quickly open the admin here and this renders out. Um, Let's see if we... It, it needs to restart because it needs to yeah. reread 
angular.json. So it won't right. error, but it will not read it. And once that's started, um, we should get our styles back. And then that's basically it for styles. So one of the things I tried to do when I was uh, still fairly new to this, I tried to import this um, from our generated library. But the thing that I didn't get or initially is that this path is only available to TypeScript. So it doesn't really make sense to say, at least by default, you cannot say like no. this style. This Unfortunately not, no. Yeah. So that is where you would use the uh, pre preprocess style preprocessor include paths or something like that. Yeah, the super complicated name. But this is yeah. basically another way to do this. And like, I personally try to keep angular.json as simple as possible. And I prefer not to add any stuff there if not needed. Uh, so then this would be a nice uh, workaround. You should uh, remove that path mapping from TS config. I should also remove the path mapping. Yeah, we're not going to yeah. use it. So we don't need it here as well. Uh, okay, so one of the things I'm going to add to the to the NXPM stack is adding a style library that does these things. That doesn't add builders. That just adds uh, a, a simple style structure to do stuff. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So I think uh, this is one of the things. Now the other common question I see a lot in the in the NX community uh, Slack is assets. I think that's another common common issue people have. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you doing with your assets? So if we go to apps admin, source, assets, let me quickly get an asset here, hub.com uh, slash nxpm.png. This should give us a PNG. Let's move it to logo.png. So we have our logo file here, uh, which is this cute little piggy. And <laughs> um, this can be referenced and then if we open our shell component, it shouldn't be. Um, it should be fairly common for people. This is how I would generally do this: so logo, and then here have some image. And the attribute source is logo, and let's set the height to a thirty. Sure. And then this should, there you go. We have rendered our logo here in the app. So this is, I think, a very common thing people do. This is plain old Angular. And I think a lot of people want to keep this clean and want to keep this inside the maybe layout or probably style repo. What's your take on this? How do you handle and such? That's another thing? special type, the assets library type. OK, interesting. So, so with your tool chain, we could do another UI asset. Okay, so let's take the style command and create this asset. Sets. Uh, generate it. It's also in the lib admin, right? Yes. Lib admin. Yep. That suits our current project structure. Very cool. Uh, ah, I'm in the assets directory. I should move back to my info. Uh, okay, and, and then this I, is... um, I'll just share with you in our studio chat an mm -hmm. image that tells you the structure of this project. Okay, let me pull this up right here and get this one added right here. Okay, so shared assets, which in our case lives in admin, admin assets, source, and here's an asset structure where we have fonts, icons, and images and the favicon. Seems familiar enough. Uh, and I'll make sure to also link this in the description of the various um, the various media, like YouTube, for instance. Um, so we generated our admin UI assets. And then I can imagine this also gets rid, we can get rid of the various builders. Exactly. So no in Angular script. JSON. We don't do any uh, There was a here. question from Os Oscar uh, Lagata asking, do we need to remove it from Angular JSON? Uh, I guess he's asking, do we need to rem remove the whole project configuration? 
And no, we don't. Um, there is one reason for keeping it, and that is the dependency graph. So if we're really careful, we can set up the, an implicit dependency uh, from our application project to these uh, special libraries, the assets and the styles library. Yeah, so that would be something like this. And there we say, okay, admin always depends on admin UI styles or style, yes. I think I made it singular. Yeah, I, I called it styles, but yeah, we're stuck with that right now. So that, that's fine, no worries. <laughs> I should pay attention better next time. Uh, uh, so this would be assets and yes. admin UI style. And then admin UI layout will indeed contain Angular code. So that will be, um, compiled when we use it. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, they, we need to put them here because they don't have TypeScript code. So um, right. the, the code, it cannot analyze it based on the TypeScript code, with, which I think is what it usually does. Right. It, that's the way it figure out the dependencies between the different library. But since we don't have an import or anything like that, it can't really tell. So we have to tell it that there is an implicit dependency between them. And that means that if there's any changes to those libraries, they should be, this one should be rebuilt. Perfect, yeah. And admin, in order for admin to build successful, it depends on these two to be also built correctly. Plus we can set up, uh, if we used the tags with the type assets and type styles, we could set up rules, linting rules that only application projects uh, and UI uh, library types can are supposed to import from the styles ones and only the application is uh, and, and UI is able to import from assets as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah, this is pretty interesting. And I think one of the benefits for me personally to have generators work on this stuff is that you automatically set up all these things correctly. So yeah. you don't have to yeah. worry about it. This is kind of neat. Yeah, this is very nice. I as I mentioned to you in, in a chat previously, mm -hmm. uh, I created a tool for this uh, yeah. in, in my Angular workspace with Angular CLI tutorial. And of course it would be a, would have been a lot nicer to have a schematics, but I didn't want to introduce the concept of a schematic for the purpose of that uh, tutorial. But I actually ended up having some something similar to your stack tool here, except it's for Angular only and it can generate these uh, different library types uh, with whatever is special in those library types. Yeah, you have it right here. It's in a, a gist yeah. that is linked from the my tutorial series. Right, and um, so... Yeah, it's basically calling uh, the ng generate commands and then it's, uh, it's modifying the Angular JSON as you can see, and it's adding a few sp files modifying the code a little bit. And of course, that's something that schematic is built to do. Yeah. I'm just doing a very simple custom script here uh, and then yeah. adding a command line API on top of it. Yeah, so what I see you doing here is just running a lot of ng generate commands. And, and quite frankly, I think for a lot of people, this already is a great start. If you have something that scaffolds out your application and does like uh, some, default things this is always most likely going to be easier and better than starting from scratch uh, yeah. and i i think for a lot of people like we can i'm i personally work on a lot of greenfield apps so i get to choose the stack so i just start out with a fresh nx workspace but not everybody's in the luxury position that you can just start over from scratch and use nx if you want like there's people that still need to discuss these kind of things and basically sell them up to their manager like, hey, uh, I want to use this NX thing, and they might not be interested. So um, that's the reason I did the <laughs> NX style workspace with Angular CLI tutorial because people were saying, oh, I really like that structure, but I can't get the buy in on, on NX. I still get that question a lot. And cool. I mean, you could just use the schematics from NX and not replace the CLI. <laughs> but yeah. so, but I, I also tried to show here that Angular CLI itself is very flexible. So yeah. it's the structure that you normally see is not like very tightly locked. Like you can 
you can uh, modify configuration. So you just need to understand the configuration. And that's what, what I'm teaching as part of this series. And then I'm slowly building up this tool to automate all of that because a lot of it is boilerplate, just scaffolding the project and the files. And we're yeah. going to need a component and the module and, and so on. Yeah. So I'm, I'm using the built-in uh, Angular uh, generators or schematics, generation schematics. Mm -hmm. and just sprinkling a, a little layer on top of that and doing some configuration changes that uh, to match that of of the nx cli uh, basically very cool yeah yeah i'm definitely going to run this as well and see what it generates and um yeah this is lovely stuff i'll also link this in the description of the youtube video sure sure um, uh, what, what we're doing <laughs> yeah let's let's move back so we were just creating the the assets library. So this is another pretty common right. question. So let me get rid of the module here because I'm sure we don't need that one. And the index.js and the test and the various um, test files so that we're just very sure uh, that we're not going to run all of that. Oscar then, is saying we could create a schematic to help developers choose the appropriate tags for new libraries. But I think you already did that with this NXPM stack. You are generating the scope and type Tax, yeah. right? It's generating scope and and um, and, and so so was really... my tool called generate yeah. project. It's doing the same thing. Now in the API where I actually want to be at at some point is that yeah. you can say NXPM generate admin lib something like this, and the, that it will the command is to... uh, behind an image right now. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah, NX uh, NXPM generate admin lib. For instance, yeah. I'm not tied on this thing, where where it, if you hit it like this, it should ask you like what app, that's mm. what application you want to build it for. So let's say we do admin, and then admin is like what type. So we can say, uh, oh, I hit enter. I shouldn't hit enter. <laughs> UI or data access, etc. Yeah. Basically, a guided way so you cannot make mistakes or you cannot pick things that are actually not like supported. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not going to actively lock it down, but I do want to guide people, mainly myself, but also <laughs> other developers in doing the right thing, just calling these things the right way. With default values, Oscar is saying. Uh, with well, default well, values, yeah. And and like some of these things already have default values. Well, uh, I, I will probably have to take a look at stack at some other time because there's some interesting things, uh, sure. I think, to look at. But uh, let's quickly go to the shared... Uh, lib. So we have this um, UI yeah, assets. Get rid of everything TS, yeah. all the TS yeah. configs, TS lint, and everything. And go through the Angular JSON, remove the tar builder targets, and so here we are. This is all empty. And then Great. Yeah. I got my assets here. So that will be the the favicon and the logo. Let's move them over. And do you use lib here, or uh, let me, I got the example? Um, I called it assets instead. Right. Instead of the libs folder. So there's assets. Based in the, the good stuff here, and then you have an images folder inside there. So let's go get images and move the logo up there. So there we go. Um, yeah. So so that's our. Assets. So here we're going to store all the good stuff. And let me quickly create. I think you had like fonts to keep. Yes. And yeah, just to show and get you and give you an idea about what could be in there. It could be fonts and icons and images and. Let's create an empty icons. So this is indeed some guidance for people to understand what they would do here now. And the main question is like, but yeah, okay, this is all cool, but in our shell component here, we can no longer refer to it like this. Yes. That is right. So I, I think you can guess what we need to do. Well, we need. To, I, I would say we need to import it from somewhere or we need to copy it over. Yeah, so we need to set up, configure the Angular CLI, the assets option of the build, Angular build for our application. So we go to the admin application right here. Yeah. And there's assets. 
right there's here. The build target. So in the options, there should be an assets one. Yeah, uh, we need uh, two objects actually. So remove all of this. That, that is what we're going to replace. Yeah. When you, when we have just a string, it's actually a sh syntactic sugar for an object. So, yeah. but um, we could, we will have two objects instead that will represent the same thing, but now in this library. The first one has a glob property, G-L-O-B, and it's just called uh, favicon.ico. Okay. Yeah. The next one is called, the next property is called input. Yep. And That's we have to point lips. it to lips uh, admin, what did we call it? UI My assets. assets. And then slash uh, SRC source. And uh, I don't know about the trailing slash. Uh, I don't have it in my example. So try to remove that last slash just, just to make sure. Yep. And then we need an output. Um, so this property. is where we want this stuff to live in and our say generated dot app. slash. Yeah. So that will, um, the Angular CLI will basically look in that folder for the fav icon file and put it out in the you know, in the dist, when we do ng build, we get the dist folder and the project folder. So it'll yeah. be in the root of that project folder in, inside of the dist folder. Right. So, so this rule is only for the fav icon. Now we need a rule for everything else. So we need yeah. kind of a, a wildcard wild root uh, um, rule, sorry. And it uh, uses the glob pattern of star star slash star. That is all folders, all files. And the yeah. input is uh, same as before, but slash assets. Assets. And output is assets, nothing else. No dot or forward slash or anything like that. Okay. So and now that I look that, uh, Yeah. I look here in my example, I see that I have favicon as well in the assets directory. This favicon should probably move one up, right? Um, I can't remember. I'm trying to remember. Uh, Let's see. Let's run oh. it. Um, Wait, what did the configuration say? It says it's in the source folder. Okay. Yeah, so that one is is a special one, so you should put it one level up, I think. Let's see what we get. Um, this looks good, and then uh, let me see. Okay, so remove the two top entries that we replaced. Yeah, but just for clarity, uh, so mm -hmm. we replaced this one line that basically says, "Hey." go to apps admin source assets, copy this over to dist, and we replace it with this glob that basically takes it from lips admin UI assets, source assets, and does the same thing. Yeah, and the reason it's a bit different is to allow us to import from assets slash whatever, but inside of this library. Right. So oh, let's get rid of these two lines. Also, to, to be fairly sure, we're going to get rid of these assets folder here because I don't yes. want this anymore. And also the favicon. So that's great. Yeah. We can get rid of that one. Um, and with well, that, we could do a build. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go here and in our terminal, uh, going to say nx build admin dash dash prod. And just to be very sure, I'm going to get rid of the this folder here of whatever is in there. Uh, so this should all build the stuff. And um, then let's quickly cycle back to here. Then afterwards, this image should still be loaded. Hmm. Uh, so yeah. And I generally think this is one of, the, I, I, I really think this is one of the most frequently asked questions on splitting up stuff and uh, it's, I think because of it not being TypeScript, it's the one thing that's not really obvious how to do because other, all the other stuff is like, if you understand what you're, what you're doing, splitting it up, use TypeScript to tie it all back together. Um, and there's little surprises there. Yeah, and we, I think we discussed it a little bit in the, a week ago when I was here. Mm -hmm. Like what's the reason for this? When it, the, the reason is to have as little as possible in your application project because then you never have to touch that or almost never. And that leaves little room to error. Also, yeah. um, not as like um, designers or um, 
UI, more UI focused developers uh, could be working in this folder, the assets folder, and they, they, they might be used to just having an assets folder with images and all that. So they nice. don't have to touch the application project. Again, another one less source, source of errors. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it also becomes very clear what belongs in here and what doesn't belong in here. Yeah. I really like this idea. And I also like the idea that you basically split out the style, which is the CSS from the assets, which are, well, the assets, fonts, icons, images with the layout. I, I was often tempted to just stick it all in once, but I think hmm. um, the more I work with it, the more I understand like, yeah, libraries are a cheap entity in an X. You can create a lot of them. It won't hurt. Yeah. Cool. So we got a successful build. So let's take a look at the dist folder here. Let me quickly refresh this and then we should see, there you go. Favacon is loaded here. Yeah. Uh, the assets are all copied over literally. And then if I run the dist folder, dist apps admin, so just pop up a live server, then hey, it doesn't get loaded. <laughs> this is demo <laughs> gods for us. Okay, so there might be another issue at this point. Let's not worry about it too much. I'll I'll take a look at why that is. Or you must have an idea right now. But I think the important thing is like we moved away from our application admin assets and now our app is getting smaller each time. Very cool. Um, so good, so that's that. Um, I think uh, I think for now, let me see if the server is still, this is still compiling. This all seems good. I'm going to rerun it one more time. Then I'm going to take a quick peek at the list to see if what's the next thing we want to talk about. I think I already know, but just want to make sure. So, uh, so something didn't work. Um, I guess we'll try to work, work on that after the session and <laughs> figure yeah. out the configuration needed. It might be. It might be that this live server doesn't pick up the right, um, it, it doesn't correctly host this single page application. I'm not sure. Um, in any case, in the stack that I'm working on, there is a Docker builder and it should build a fully functional Docker image where the API hosts the front end. So you'll end up with one Docker container that bo hosts both, which to get started is probably a great point uh, to start off with. Uh, there you go. Here, assets.logo is not found. Okay, this is interesting. Here, the dev server has the same uh, image. I, I think I know why. It's because it's not longer assets slash logo. It's assets. Oh, it's images, logo. right. Yeah. Images logo. <laughs> I'm such, such a beginner at some point. There you go. Awesome. Cool. So that did work. Now, in the back, I'm just going to run the build again. See if that also fixed our extra sure build. And this would be a great moment to do a commit so we can have that uh, isolated from each other. Uh, gonna take a quick peek at our notes here. Uh, people are gonna see the shared secrets that we have. The secret sauce. Um, so yeah, UI libraries, assets, modular API structure. I think for now, let's keep with Angular. I think that's uh, more than enough for us to discuss. I saw an interesting article yesterday on, uh, got posted on the Angular Community Discord. Join if you haven't already, it's awesome. And it was, the question uh, stated in the article was, how does app initializer work? What do you need to know about dynamic configuration? Yeah. Which is probably the second most answer, asked question in the NX workspace, how to do this? How to do app initialization? This is not something particularly um, NX related, but it does uh, get asked a lot of times. Sure. Basically, the two things that are um, the two methods that are discussed is either use your environment or use App Initializer. Um, personally, I think there's there's a place for both. There's also a few more options, actually. Cool. So let's let's take a quick look. Um, yeah, we we also have four articles on that and angle and depth <laughs> there was one recently published and there was three older ones but a lot of awesome uh, offers the latest one is by kyler johnson mm -hmm. 
on indepth.dev. And um, yeah, basically what Angular gives you out of the box is this these environment files. Yeah, That could be fine. I mean, the thing that's wrong here or that's, um, yeah, is that that is part of the build, the TS build and the bundles and all that. Yep. So you will have a hard time replacing that after building. So if you're do going yep. for build once, deploy many times with different configurations, uh, you're in for a tough ride. Yep. Uh, so that, that is why you would, instead you would, for example, extract it out to an a JSON file. And then that JSON file, I mean, you could put it in the assets folder and you can have one for prod and one for development, one for staging, and you could use the file replacements thingies as well. Uh, but yeah. then you don't have to, then you're not able to separate um, deployment from release. So you wouldn't, I mean, depending on the values you want, you want to keep in there. I mean, your your host names might not be changing very often, so it might be fine to leave them in a static file, part of, part of your build or whatever. But if you want to, you, if, if you want to put that file in later or change it or have your deployment pipeline changing it based on which environment you're deploying to, um, yeah, then you you want to have it in a JSON file and then you want to load that JSON file either through an app initializer or even in the main file before you start bootstrapping the Angular application that yeah. is actually necessary in, in a few cases where you need to initialize something and load something else before or even in an, an app initializer because you can't have app initializers depending on each other. So that is a bit of an edge case. Right. And I would guess that this article is um, describing, I haven't read that one you linked to, but I would guess it's de describing exactly that of having an app initializer with a configuration service or something like that, loading the the, the adjacent file from from the the web server. Uh, this is basically what it what it does. Yes, and it explains like here you can have various environment files which works, but only to a certain extent. Yeah. Basically, the same thing that you described. Um, and then here a configuration JSON, and then you have a load configuration method that uses the HTTP client to get this configuration. And this one is all provided using the app initializer provider, uh, which then loads this. Um, so let's take a quick look. Okay, so without doing too much things at once, I just want to make sure that the app builds correctly now. So this now works perfect. Now you see projects now, that's because like, okay, it cannot find a GraphQL server, but the asset at least gets loaded in the style as well. Okay. So this is a great moment to do a quick commit. Um, add style, layout, and assets. Oops. Cool. So one of the things I did, and, and for those of you paying attention, you already saw like, hey, there's no environments here. And in by, my... by the way, I, I just want to complete the picture. The fourth option is having an endpoint with configuration values. <laughs> yeah, this is what I tend to use. and. Uh, because I, I tend to build most of my apps inside a Docker container where they're hosted by a node process. And I like to have environment variables in this node deployment that dictate like, hey, you're running stage or you're running Spanish version instead of the English version. Like I think translation is another thing that's, that's uh, pretty common. Um, or simple things like, hey, I want this app to use the blue layout and the other one uses the red layout. So have anything that you wanna configure but you don't want to build a specific build for this thing. So um, yeah, this is interesting. So here, the um, uh, let's close the feature shell. So the app environment is already gone here. In the, N uh, in the NXBM stack, I built a feature core library. And this takes the environment. So this has the environment and then in Angular JSON, a very similar thing to with the assets. I changed the file replacement so it replaces these two files instead of doing that in app. Yeah. I would, uh, again, I would have that as a special library type called environments and only mm -hmm. have the environments files, nothing else. And again, for that reason that you should almost never be touching that and that should be very clear. 
Right. And and again, to set up this restrictions on which modules can actually import it based on the library type. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense actually. Um, and and it also makes sense in the idea that libraries are cheap. You can you can easily create a lot of them. That doesn't and, hurt. Um, so you call the core. Uh, so what what other things were you thinking about putting in in this library? It actually already has something, and this is I think when I started out. I briefly touched on this, so it's great that you come back to this. In here inside app module, I load my feature shell. And last week we discussed like you only need to load the shell, but I cheated here and I also load my core. Let's take a quick look what it does. Uh, it includes HTTP client module. Yeah. It's needed for my GraphQL client. So here's where I actually initialize my GraphQL client. Okay, so that's all your root, root level providers. Yes, basically, yep. Okay, so... First mistake you did, according to the Lars structure, yeah. Uh, if if you want to have a separate core module like that, and that is totally fine, yeah. Uh, you should import it from the feature shell library. Yeah. So Actually, that, yeah. the reason the reason here was laziness because at the point that I generated this, <laughs> my my app shell didn't know what the name of the app was. So that means that in here I couldn't just say, oh, you know what, this thing is called admin feature module since since now i changed this so i now can know which scope and which name i in so this is definitely something i'll change so uh thanks for calling me out on that this is because then this is how we should have the app module right and nothing more yeah exactly perfect, perfect. okay yeah totally okay, agree. from now on you will basically never almost never have to touch the application project you removed yeah. everything from there so changes should be made in the feature shell module yeah instead and and you sh that should be very intentional when you need to make changes there adding another route adding another configuration or root provider yeah stuff like that that's what belongs cool. in here and then so for this feature core module uh doing the client module here would be a good one um yeah. Uh, GraphQL setup, which is definitely some reusable part of code, but sure. then also a bit specific because it has like the, um, for instance, it takes my GraphQL URL from the environment. Very good. So okay, so environments are moved up, so they're out of the way. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this in a separate library as you suggested. I'm gonna fix those two. Now, one of the things that I really like to do for initialization is have my API export a slash config endpoint. So um, that would be slash API slash config, for instance. I don't have this created right now, but this would present a JSON object, which gets dynamically f uh, filled with uh, variables. Um, and what we can probably do here is go to the library. And this for now is gonna live in core. And I think, let me see if uptime is working. How's your schedule, by the way? Um, for me, it's still four o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm totally fine with uh, spending some more time. But we'll probably look at this app configuration and then um, call it a day, and maybe continue next week. Sure. How about you? Yeah, I think uh, the attention span uh, of of uh, developers might also be up at this point. <laughs> Yeah, so, <laughs> um, so let me get this one and then say uh, environment. I'm gonna quickly create this API endpoint, uh, this.config.get. And I think I call this configuration. Yeah, there you go, environment. Take a few more of these and add them all. I promise I'll make it quick. There we go. Okay, so this is configuration that got exported. And then nice. we have a REST endpoint. Give the API a second to restart, but now we should say config. And once that started, mistake. No, there you go. Okay, so we have a config object that gets exported awesome. by our API. Awesome. And 
how do we go about this? Um, so in our front end, would, would this be something that would live also in, in my case, in the feature core? So we're looking to do an app initializer that calls mm -hmm. some service, right? Yeah. Yeah, let me think about that. Um, I'm also yeah, glad I, there's, that there's where, some um, stuff that, that you that, don't that, have an answer yeah. to immediately. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, because this is one of the things that might be in a library type called configuration. Right. Yeah. And since we don't have that, feature core is probably a, a good suggestion for now. Yeah. Then let's, that's definitely a good thing. Let's for now um, do it this way quickly. The service here, make it injectable and provide it in the in core module. It's singular. Um, sorry, add it to providers here. Now in this service, we want to inject the HTTP client. HTTP client and basically you have a load config that says this.http.get environment. Dot. Well, I don't have this property, so I'm just going to add it API for now. API plus slash config. Then, sorry, uh, subscribe, right? Uh, well, actually, just return it and uh, call that from the initializer. I think this is the configuration. Let's quickly add a, a debugging here. So we have a tab. Yeah. So we can actually see. So this is the config and then uh, config loaded config. Cool. So this is our load config method. We have an admin feature core service. It's injected here. It's provided here. So it should be available. Um, and then we need to add this other provider that does the app initialization. Yes. So this is provide app initializer. Yeah. And then uh, as a dependency, I want to do the admin yeah. feature core service. So admin feature core service as a dependency. Yes. Um, and then I want to use a factory, if I recall correctly. Yes. And uh, please remember to put in a multi multi true. <laughs> That's really? an easy one to forget. Yeah. yeah. Can you briefly touch on what that does? So basically, app initializer is an injection token. And if we provide a single value, well, that's what we do in a lot of cases. But in this case, it's actually expecting the application to be able to provide more than one app initializer. So when we say multi true, we the, our providers will not override each other, so we you could have, actually have another provide app initializer right next to it, and uh, the initializer will get an array of all of these and call them one by one or in parallel, whatever, to um, kick off the initialization before bootstrapping. Very cool. So this means that if we would like, we could have another library that provides their own app initialization. And this multi-true will make sure they all get executed and not like the yeah, last you, one. Yeah, you could even have another one right here. I mean, uh, it could be one for fetching translation files or something like right. that. Very cool. Uh, so use factory. And if I understand it correct, correctly, this is a math, a function. Should be a function. Yeah. The, the app initializer factors are a bit special. So I think that should be a function that returns a function that does something, if I re recall right. correctly. Uh, this, I think the second one can be anonymous. The first one cannot. Yeah, the, the first one should have this uh, service as the dependency. Like this? Yeah. And here, what we can do is say service.loadconfig and return that one. And that one is then returning an observable. So the Angular will be subscribing to that one. 
And that is why there's no need to subscribe and in, in, inside of the service itself, Ledangula take care of the subscription management for you. Very cool. Let's also add a quick tab here, just so we're, um, so we're sure that we can see what handles, uh, uh, how this is getting handled. So okay. adding a console log, oh, this doesn't really go well, console log. And if this is all wired up correctly. Yeah, Nacho actually... has a good point that you, should, you probably need to export that factory function or yep. the compiler will be unhappy. Yep. Let's take a look at how this works. At this moment, um, I don't see it. Export function, export load configuration. Let's quickly go to our dev server and just make sure, give this a restart and a refresh. Um, and then like right now we're just loading it in a lot of use cases, you would probably have some place where you would cache this maybe in your NGRX store or uh, a behavior subject here, probably the easiest to get started. Um, so then at another point, you can uh, inject the service wherever you need it and just refer to the configuration. I mean, you could store it in on a property of this service. Yeah. So let's make a proper config, which or is a new behavior. Uh, we have a subject yeah. or just a random? Uh, just a static property is fine because it'll be uh, hydrated before any part of the application loads. I mean, the, the only exception to that rule is you can't have other initializing initializers depending on that uh, service then. Right. But inside of your application components and service and all of that, the configuration should be available before any life cycle starts. Yeah. That's okay. The so, um, the app reloaded, but I don't see anything rendered here. So it somehow looks like this code doesn't get executed. Okay. Uh, let's quickly peek over here. If we can see, um, if we can get a clue on how this load configuration is actually exactly the same what we do, right? So mm. it's a method that injects the loader, multi-true app initializer, use factory. And this, well, they use a two promise here. I'm not fairly sure if I understand why you would move back to a promise, but. And we, we did return that uh, observable right from the service function, yeah. We did, okay. Yeah. Uh, let's add a quick debug method here. And we can see if it gets triggered. A load config loaded, it did get loaded. That's interesting. Okay. okay. Let me quickly debug to see if I got the environment API URL correct, because that's another common use case for these kind of logical okay. errors. Hacking uh -huh. stuff together like this. Well, this should be all right. It's slash API slash config, which what works. Um, and in the example here, it also does not have a, well, they don't have subscribe, but they do have a dot promise. Do we, should, maybe we do need to subscribe at some place? Or is mm, this totally uh, weird? I mean, we, we could try it now just to see if it, it works, but I'm pretty sure the initializer should be able to handle promises and observables. Oh. The the only, I mean, the important thing is that observable can only emit once and then it should complete. Look at this, I added the subscribe and now we get to see this thing loaded. Okay. So it's first being loaded in the service and then it's available in the module. And um, uh, yeah, admin feature core here. So this would be static config. So here we would say admin feature core service dot config equals config. So the right. subscribing fixed it or what? Yes, uh, it looks like subscribing here in module. I added the dot subscribe to the load configuration method. Okay. That seems to have fixed it. 
So that's another one that I'll definitely uh, figure out before um, posting this. I'll probably post the answer or we discuss it next week. Hmm. Um, but then with this service, we should now we go to our shell. Uh, so our shell component. Here I should actually load in this config, right? I should be able to say, give me the admin feature core service dot config. Yeah. Let's just rawly print it raw here, config and pipe it through the JSON pipe. Of course, and we're saying here that this config will never change after the application is, is booted. Yeah. In a in a more realistic scenario, you'd probably I, I generally do this in a behavior subject. But I think if your app is only like a fully NGRX or NGXS or Akita or any state management, this is most likely something you'll add up in state. Well, it, it would depend on whether the configuration will ever change at runtime. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, I really have, like. Uh, you could have feature flags that could be toggled at any point in time. In that case, you would want to reload that config. And then right. an observable is an, a great answer to that use yeah. case. Yeah, but so if, it really depends. If it really change, then a property is fine. Uh, you don't have to mess around with an observable then. Yeah. Yeah, which is, I think, for me, the best, the, the, the main reason to do it in a behavior subject. Like you get like best of both worlds. You can access them straight away mm. without subscribing, or you can subscribe to the changes. Did I just hear you say behavior subject dot value? I didn't directly say it literally, but uh, <laughs> is this, I, don't something... hope, I don't hope that Alex is watching this. Sorry, Alex, if you are watching. <laughs> Alex is actually the one that did convert me back <laughs> to NGRX. Yeah. Uh, I was in the luxury position of having, uh, I was able to watch a workshop, attend the live workshop of Alex and uh, with all the new stuff there, just, I, I didn't really pay attention when the generator methods got introduced. For me, it was a breath of fresh air. Nice. OK, did we get everything working here with the configuration? I think we did. Uh, let me quickly fix this import right here. And, I like um, that, um, that small endpoint you did for the mapping the uh, environment variables to yeah an object. Um, I was actually yeah, so discussing this with uh, Oscar Lagada from the chat uh, yeah. a few days ago. Yeah, so this is this is a pattern. And actually, you know that um, uh, Firebase uses a very similar pattern. I'm not sure if you're aware, but Firebase uh, exposes their hosting environment. And basically, everything you need to know to configure Firebase, uh, I always forget what it is, but I think it's like uh, slash slash underscore env slash init or something. Okay. Okay. Nice. And what they actually do is they expose it as a JS and as a JSON. Mm. And the nice thing is, if you do this JS one, they will create a object on window that you can just import. Oh. Okay. So this is probably the other alternative. Before I was aware of uh, the functionality of App Initializer, what I would do inside my index HTML is have a script tag here, and this script tag would load slash API slash config.js that would make it available in the window and it's kind of a, a workaround the, the beauty of it is it works for any front side application you want to do like it's, it doesn't use any angular you just include the script tag it will populate a window and then at that point what i would use to do inside my environment.ts i would basically say okay i assume that this structure is on window now make it available through my environment and that's kind of um i I, right now, I see it kind of as a hack, but it, it does work. Uh, but yeah, this, this stuff is pretty nice. And I'll make sure to add this to uh, NGXS uh, NXPM stack as well. So if people want to check this out, uh, this is a pattern that works. And like to make the picture complete, this, this environment, this config service is already, oh, I need to see where I did this. This configuration object, this is already using environment variables. So in the API, you can just set stuff in that env, or if you're running, running it in Docker, you can set it in Docker, and that will automatically populate and, and propagate to the front end. Nice. So cool. Um, 
and I think for it for this for today, uh, let me quickly look at the notes again if there's anything related that we should look at. But um, yeah, I think this is very important. I think the question here, where to put for root stuff, yep. kind of got answered by looking at GraphQL. I think that would be my app, my admin feature core library. Exactly. Either use the, the feature shell library or import other uh, libraries like the, the core one you did, uh, yeah. import it from the feature shell library. Cool. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, there's a form, few more things. Uh, I would love to take a look at NGRX structure and um, go from there. So I would love to invite you for coming back maybe next week. If that works sure. for you. And we make it a trilogy. Oh, sweet. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Uh, well, I think um, that's it for today. Lars, thank you so much for being here again. It was a, a big pleasure. And um, I must say, this is for me, it's super interesting to do this. And um, I've, I'm a solo developer on most projects. And most projects, I propose the structure and people go with it or they don't. But um, I not often have the chance to talk about these things in this level. So I really appreciate uh, you sharing all your knowledge. Super valuable. I appreciate it too. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody for joining us. It was awesome to know that people watch this stuff and uh, we'll, we will be back next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.